Stairway to Heaven is the fourth song off the iconic hard rock album Led Zeppelin 4 by Led Zeppelin. Though the album contains many fan favourites like Black Dog, Rock and Roll and Misty Mountain Hop, Stairway to Heaven has transcended them all to become one of rock's most legendary songs as well as one of its most mysterious. It has consistently been placed on a list of the greatest songs of all time in outlets such as Rolling Stone, VH1 and Q Magazine was named among Rock and Roll Hall of Fame's 500 songs that shaped rock and roll, and despite never being released as a single, was one of the most requested songs on FM radio stations in the US during the 1970s. Jimmy Page's guitar solo is often cited as one of, if not the greatest guitar solos of all time. The first time I heard Stairway, I was at my uncle's farm in rural New Zealand. My cousins had a computer that was better than mine, so I used to play their games as much as I could. This was also around the time that MP3s and file sharing were becoming popular and they had a large library of music on their computer. I'd heard of Led Zeppelin, I was a teenage guitarist after all, but I'd never really checked them out, so when I saw the artist entry on Windows Media Player, I clicked it only to find one song, Stairway to Heaven. Those next eight minutes were transcendent. I'd never heard music like this before. The mysterious floaty chords, the erythral flutes instantly transported me to a time of knights and troubadours. Robert Plant's cryptic, fantastical lyrics baffled and intrigued me, conjuring images of spirits and far off forgotten lands. What was the song that sounded like a ballad played by a traveling bard at the end of The Prancing Pony doing on a hard rock album in the early 70s? And as if to answer my question, the song seamlessly transformed into a powerful hard rock jam with a guitar solo that melted my tiny adolescent face. The vocals that scream into the stratosphere over the powerful rhythms of the drum and bass and those final haunting words lingered in my ear as the song faded away. I'll never forget that feeling of hearing Stairway for the first time and the second and third and fiftieth time on the same day. Sorry, uncle. And I had so many questions. Who was this woman? Why did she want to buy this stairway? How could someone play guitar like that? And how did someone sing that high? And what the hell is a hedgerow? Well, never fear, 16-year-old me. I'm here to try and answer all those questions for you, especially that one about the hedgerow. Stairway to Heaven is a long song, and there's a lot going on within it, so I hope you're ready for a long-ass video. So, strap yourself in, and then unstrap yourself, grab a cup of coffee, strap yourself back in, make sure the dog has something to occupy themselves and enjoy Stairway to Understanding Stairway to Heaven. Let's start the same way we always do, which is to lay out the roadmap of the song. Stairway to Heaven bucks the normal verse-chorus form in favour of a more through-composed form that we find in a lot of progressive rock music, but can be broken down into three sections that themselves can be broken down into smaller parts. Each section is separated by a short transitional section. Let's label each of these A, B and C, and the transitional sections will be called T1 and T2. The song begins with that iconic chordal motif that is the bane of every guitar centre employee, an arpeggiated chord progression played on acoustic guitar. This four bar motif is repeated and the guitar is joined by several recorders playing a melody in a style reminiscent of Renaissance music. The chord progression then changes slightly, establishing a slightly brighter tonality for the next eight bars. These two chord progressions form the basis of section A. Robert Plant's voice enters, introducing us to the lady who's buying a stairway to heaven. After playing through these two progression once more, the song comes to its first transitional section, T1. This is a variation of the opening chordal motif, but the guitar arpeggiates the chords using semiquavers as opposed to quavers. This injects some energy into the song and helps propel it forward into section B, a trend that will continue throughout the rest of the song. Much like in section A, section B can be broken down into two contrasting parts that vary in dynamic, rhythm and tonality. And while section A and section B are different, they share some common DNA that helps to make them feel connected and cohesive. This is something I've talked about before in regards to writing longer through composed songs and is important if you don't want your song to sound like a jumbled mess. Okay, so in the first part of section B, Jimmy Page is strumming chords on acoustic guitar while John Paul Jones lays down the bass line on a Hörner Elektra piano. The second part returns to arpeggiated chords. This is split between two guitars, one playing in open position while the other plays inversions higher up the neck. After a couple of repetitions of these parts, John Bonham enters on the drums, adding
adding yet another layer and injection of energy to the song. This is also the first really noticeable increase in tempo, but it should be noted the song slowly increases in tempo across its whole runtime. This, along with the constant addition of new parts, increase in dynamic, rhythmic complexity, and changes from acoustic to electric instruments, all aid the slow and steady build in energy throughout the song to its two, yes two, climaxes. I'll talk about that bit a little later. Now that the drums have entered, John Paul Jones adds a bass line to the arpeggiated part of section B, while changing the bass line of the strumming part to a busier Motown inspired line. Things continue to ramp up until we reach the final transition section T2. Jimmy Page strums this awesome suspended motif while John Paul Jones and John Bonham mirror his rhythms and crank the tempo up 10 clicks across the short 9 bar section, creating this huge triumphant sound that feels like it's really building towards something. Then, BAM! Guitar solo. And what a guitar solo! Section C of the song slams into your face like a stampede. Bonham lays down a solid 4-4 rock beat, peppered with epic drum fills. Jimmy Page shreds it up with a beautiful, melodic, face-melting guitar solo. And, I think, the real standout of this section, John Paul Jones outlines the harmony, lays down the solid rhythmic figures that define this whole section, adds interesting syncopated figures and cool-as-hell fills that shoot all over the bass. I'll talk more about Jones's bass lines later on, but I will say, doing this analysis has given me a newfound appreciation for Jones. The solo reaches a climax with a high, screeching, lightning-fast arpeggio from Page, and the band burst into the final stretch of the song. The rhythmic figures that were established by Jones under the guitar solo form the bass for the second part of section C, where Plant's voice takes center stage. Previously sweet, angelic, and within a modest vocal range, now aggressive, edgy, and stratospherically high to mirror the change from the chilled-out soft rock to hardcore hard rock. The band continues to rock out through this part, building up to a second climax where Plant holds out a long high note that blends together with some of the final wailing notes from the guitar as the band slows and crashes into the final chord of the song. As the final notes ring out, Plant sings those final iconic lyrics in a lingering, haunting whisper. I want to start this analysis in an odd place for a music theory channel, but it's with the lyrics and the song's meaning as a whole. Now, deriving meaning from art is always problematic. First, there is always an element of subjectivity when one looks at art and tries to discover meaning behind it. Your experiences, tastes, beliefs, etc. will colour your ultimate understanding of the art. Second, while it's true that the artist would have had their own intended meaning when creating the art, short of straight up asking them for the meaning, it's near impossible to know for sure their intentions. Third, there is always going to be interpretations and connections that were unintended by the artists. Art isn't created in a vacuum, and so it's inevitable that consumers of the art will find meaning where none was intended. Depending on what day it is, I still interpret the song a different way, and I wrote the lyrics, stated Plant in an interview in the early 70s. Unfortunately, or perhaps fortunately for us, Robert Plant has remained vague in his explanation of the meaning behind the song. This is almost an invitation by Plant for the listener to derive their own meaning from the song, and perhaps this is what makes the song so universal. Plant's reluctance to lay out the meaning explicitly affords everyone's interpretation a certain amount of validity, making it easier for anyone to connect with the song, no matter their background. While much of what I've read from others trying to pass meaning from the song talk about critiques of materialism, consumerism, religion, etc., or trying to push some satanic agenda, more on that later, I tend to enjoy the song more as a fantastical tale. Imagine it being sung in a smoky tavern by a travelling bard, letting the mystical imagery wash over me, not thinking too much about the deeper meaning behind the words. This is, after all, how the song Song was written. According to Plant's testimony during a plagiarism trial, more on that later, Stairway was mostly written sitting by the fire in an old stone workhouse in Hampshire, England. In his biography of Led Zeppelin, When Giants Walked the Earth, Mick Wall quotes Robert Plant. 
I was holding a pencil and paper and, for some reason, I was in a very bad mood. Then, all of a sudden, my hand was writing out the words. There's a lady who's sure all that glitters is gold and she's buying a stairway to heaven. I just sat there and looked at the words and then I almost leapt out of my seat. Jimmy Page stated, More words would come the following day as the band worked their way bit by bit through the song's epic journey. As we were doing all that, Robert was writing down the lyrics. They just came to him really quickly. He said it was like someone was guiding his hand. Plant has also stated that a lot of his writing is influenced by reading Scottish author Lewis Spencer's writing on mythology as well as the works of J.R.R. Tolkien. This image of Plant and Page sat by the fire in an old stone building in the farmlands of England, spontaneously composing a story laced with imagery from old Scottish folklore and Middle Earth with no particular agenda, almost begs it to be viewed the same way. There's another factor that I think might have influenced the writing slash meaning of the song and it's summed up pretty well in this comment I found on Genius.com. This all happened in 1970. It's fair to assume they were pretty high, as in 1970s lead frickin' Zeppelin high. So yeah, deep and meaningful biblical allegory or some hippies trying to rhyme, often unsuccessfully, bits of Tolkien-style mythology in between coughs and giggles. You decide. Again, none of this is to say that we can't draw our own meaning from the song, but just that it's more likely Plant did not intend much of it, and that's fine. So with those caveats out of the way, let's look at my interpretation of the song. Here's what I think the song means. Narratively, the song can be broken down into six different sections. I'm going to label them like this. The Lady, Tolkien, Religious, Hedro, Morality, and Climax. The Lady establishes the story of the lady who wants to buy a stairway to heaven. She believes that material wealth will be enough to get her into heaven. She is also rather self-important, believing that even though the gates of heaven are closed, she will be able to say the word and they will be opened for her. There is also a small reference to Tolkien here. In The Fellowship of the Ring, Frodo Baggins is given a poem by Gandalf the Grey as a means to confirm that Strider is the real Strider. It is later revealed that the poem was written by Bilbo Baggins when he discovered the true identity of Aragorn as the heir to Isildur. Tolkien himself may have borrowed this line from Shakespeare's Merchant of Venice, but it seems more likely that Plant got it from Tolkien rather than Shakespeare. The first stanza of the poem is a description of Aragorn, or Strider as he's known at the time, and basically says, don't judge a book by its cover. Sure, Strider's a gruff, grimy ranger who wanders the wilds, but his bloodline is strong and will not wither. The lady, however, thinks the opposite of this. She believes all that glitters is gold, that you should judge a book by its cover, and that cover is pure gold and written by her in golden ink from a golden pen, so let her into heaven. Unfortunately for the lady, the Bible is pretty clear on this point. Matthew 19.24 states, Again I tell you, it is easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Maybe she should have spent less time buying Gucci handbags and more time reading the Lord's Word! Tolkien is my favourite section. In Tolkien's fiction, the West refers to the Undying Lands, a land reachable only by immortals and ring bearers, the place to which the elves wish to return. In Stairway, the narrator feels their spirit crying for leaving as they look toward the West. They are coming to the end of their days and feel drawn towards the Undying Lands. This is kind of odd because mortals are unable to reach the Undying Lands in the lore of Tolkien, as the way was lost at the end of the Second Age due to a cataclysmic event. This only leaves one reasonable conclusion. Stairway to Heaven was actually written by Galadriel. The next two lines are a bit more straightforward. The narrator remembers a time watching someone, probably Gandalf or Bilbo, blowing smoke rings while others looked on. It makes me think of that scene from the movies where Bilbo blows a smoke ring and Gandalf sails a smoke ship through it. I don't think this was in the books, which only leaves one reasonable conclusion. Galadriel is a Time Lord who travelled forward in time to 2001, saw the Lord of the Rings films, travelled back to 1971, and proceeded to write a song featuring imagery from said films. Religious delves deeper into the religious themes of the song. There's a chapter in Revelations where a great multitude of people sang to the Lord, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne, and unto the Lamb, after which they were all ushered into the 
kingdom of heaven. This line is reminiscent of that idea. The piper, God, leads us to reason or salvation when we all sing together as one, or just the general idea of collective thinking in religion, all coming together and agreeing to praise the Lord in unison so he will welcome us into the kingdom of heaven and a new day will dawn for us and the trees will laugh at us. <laughs> Hedro gives us two pieces of advice to live by. Number one, if you hear some shit going down in your hedro, a hedro being a row of bushes that divides properties in England, don't freak. It's just some new life born of the spring. Number two, it's never too late to change the path you're on. You're never too old to make serious life changes, learn a new skill, go back to school, quit your job, move to Barcelona. You know, the good stuff. Mortality refers back to the piper in religious, and he's the ever-nagging voice in your head that reminds you of your own mortality. That feeling you get when you look to the west and you're like, holy crap, I'm 32 and I've done nothing with my life. I have no wife or kids or house. My degree is meaningless. The earth is on fire and ravaged by a deadly pandemic, so I'm probably going to die soon. What am I doing with my life? <laughs> you know, that, that feeling. Climax is the climax of the song. Well, the narrative climax. I'll talk about the musical climax later. It talks about the journey towards the end of life as we wind on down the road. Our deeds, the things we left behind, our shadow grows taller than who we are. This could be the idea that someone's legacy can become larger than who the real person was, overshadowing them. Or perhaps it means the bad things we have done will be remembered long after the good deeds are forgotten. And as we walk down this road, we are offered two choices. Do we, one, stick with what the lady has been telling us, that possessions and material wealth are the most important things, or number two, follow the piper, listen to reason, you know what needs to be said, call the tune, say the words, Kaladin, don't waver from the path, be a rock. The ending is left ambiguous and it's up to you what you choose. As I alluded to earlier, there has been a certain amount of controversy surrounding Stairway throughout its life. No Stairway! Denied. The first is its supposed satanic messages, and the second are the allegations of plagiarism. I'll talk about the satanic messages first, and then the plagiarism, which will lead nicely into actually analyzing the music. Ever since the advent of recording technology, people have been manipulating recordings. When Edison invented the phonograph, he noted, when played backwards, the song is still melodious in many cases. Some of the strains are sweet and novel, but altogether different from the song reproduced the right way. In the late 50s, a record called Car Trouble was released by the band The Eligibles. The song contained two phrases that when reversed could be heard as, and you get my daughter back by 10.30, you bum, and now look at here, cats, stop running these records backwards. This is believed to be the first example of what is known today as backmasking, the act of playing a message backwards that was recorded forwards. It's quite a common technique used by recording artists and producers to create a very very specific sound, and not just with voices. For example, there are guitar pedals you can use to reverse the sound of the notes you play, making for very interesting sounding guitar parts. Radiohead took this technique to the next step in their song Like Spinning Plates from the album Amnesiac. When recording the voice, Tom York listened to what the verse sounded like played backwards, learned how to sing it that way, recorded it, and then reversed that recording. The result, while comprehensible, is very eerie.
John Lennon would experiment with this technique a lot during the sessions for Revolver, adding it to vocal parts of the song Rain and the guitar solo in Tomorrow Never Knows. The controversy came when a caller to a Detroit radio station claimed that the Beatles song Revolution 9 contained the backward message, turn me on dead man, turn me on dead man, turn me on dead man. And later the song I'm So Tired contained Paul is a dead man, miss him, miss him, miss him. And then the religious right got hold of the idea and ran with it, claiming that rock bands were cooperating with the Church of Satan to hide subliminal messages in their music and trick everyone into worshipping Satan. Listen for Satan, 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 and a fourth Satan. He is God, he is God, he is God. And then the laughter, you hear the laughter. Okay. Satan, Satan, Satan. He is God, he is God. They held lectures on the dangers of backmasking, claiming that singers had been possessed by Satan who used their voices to create backwards messages. They even held record burnings at their churches and managed to pass legislation to prevent backmasking that can manipulate our behavior without our knowledge or consent and turn us into disciples of the Antichrist. One of the main focuses of their ire was Stairway to Heaven. As we've already discussed, the song contains strong religious imagery. Is it really too much of a stretch to think that subliminally coded satanic messages were hiding beneath this mass of religious metaphors? People have long tried to contest that violence, drugs, and sexual content in media has an influence on the moral fabric of society. In the 1930s, many large-scale studies were done to try and evaluate the influence these themes in media had on the general public. In the 1950s, it was television and comic books that drove people to sex and violence. In the 1960s, it was Elvis's gyrating hips. In the 90s, it was rap music and video games. But did you also know that video games Violence. And in the 70s, it was that damn rock and roll music. Without getting into a big diatribe about how sex, drugs, and violence in media affect us, I'll simply state, watching, reading, or listening to violence, sex, and drugs won't magically influence you to want to murder people in a sex and drug-fueled rampage. There are plenty of studies out there that prove this. Go and read, my children. As for the satanic messages in Stairway to Heaven, I remember investigating this when I was a kid, and... I got the mp3s, found the section that supposedly contained the message, reversed it with computer wizardry, which is separate from rock and roll satanic powers, and listened, and listened, and listened some more. Eventually I was able to make out a few things, but it wasn't until I read what I was supposed to be hearing that I actually heard it. Here, have a listen. Let me know what you think is being said in the comments. Fan engagement. <laughs> See, human brains are great at seeing patterns where there are none. It's called pareidolia, the tendency for incorrect perception of a stimulus as an object, pattern, or meaning known to the observer, such as seeing shapes in clouds, seeing faces in inanimate objects or abstract patterns, or hearing hidden messages in music. It was once considered a symptom of human psychosis, you know, the whole Rorschach thing, but is now seen as normal human behavior. So some radio DJs created some hype surrounding backward messages in rock music. A bunch of people go looking for those messages and their crazy monkey brains that are predisposed to find patterns where there are none find them hidden within a song containing heavy religious imagery. Case closed. Robert Plant has also responded to the accusation stating, to me it's very sad because Stairway to Heaven was written with every best intention and as far as reversing tapes and putting messages on the end that's not my idea of making music. Controversy number two. Okay, we're actually getting into some music here. Whoop, whoop. So in 2014, the bass player from the band Spirit filed a copyright lawsuit against Led Zeppelin, claiming Zepp had stolen the iconic riff from their song, Taurus. So let's take a look at the two riffs 
and compare. Now, I will admit there are definitely similarities, especially when you listen to the songs side by side, but I still think the plagiarism claim is baseless. Ignoring the fact that only three bars are similar, that unique melodies are added by Page's guitar, Jones's recorders, and Plant's voice, that chord progressions can't be copyrighted, and that the plagiarism trial resulted in the jury agreeing that the similarities did not amount to plagiarism. Ignoring all that, I would still like to offer a counterpoint. See what I did there? And that counterpoint comes in the form of a musical term, kesh, or contrapuntal elaboration of static harmony. Sounds complicated, but it's really not. The term contrapuntal refers to the general movement of two lines with respect to each other. There are a bunch of different types of contrapuntal motion, but that's not really relevant right now. Just think moving line. Next, static harmony is exactly what it sounds like. Harmony, which is static. So, if we take a chord and it remains static for a while, bam, we've got ourselves some static harmony, and now we just need to elaborate on it contrapuntally. And bam, wow, we've got ourselves some contrapuntal elaboration of static harmony. Now, there are many ways this can manifest in music, but there is one specific example that I'd like to give, and it's so prolific that it has its own name, the minor line cliché. Let's take a look at an early example of the minor line cliché from the 1937 jazz standard My Funny Valentine. The first four bars contain the cliché. The first chord is C minor, followed by C minor over B, C minor over B flat, and then finally C minor over A. Can you see where I'm going with this? We have some static harmony, C minor, that is being elaborated on by a chromatic line descending from C down to A. Contrapuntal elaboration of static harmony. And this is exactly what is going on in Stairway, and in fact, Taurus. But it wouldn't be called a cliché if there weren't a myriad of examples throughout musical history, so here are a few others. Point being, the chords used at the start of Stairway to Heaven and Taurus aren't unique to them at all. They were heavily ingrained into the musical canon decades before these songs existed. Here's a song I think sounds pretty damn similar to Taurus as well. Is There Anybody Out There by Pink Floyd? It's not exactly the same, but it has a similar feel to it. It's arpeggiated chords on an acoustic guitar, accompanied by strings, and not just that, it's using Kesh, albeit in a slightly different way. My point is that songs can sound similar, even take influence from one another. How is art supposed to evolve if not? But that doesn't amount to plagiarism. Now, for a closer look at the rest of the song. As I mentioned in the roadmap, there are three sections to the song separated by transitional sections, with each section containing two different contrasting parts. Here's section A, part one and two, transitional section A, Section B, part 1 and 2, transitional section B, and section C, part 1 and 2. This form of music is what is called through composed, and I'll go into more detail about this after we've looked at the music more closely. Section A, part 1, seems like a good place to start. So, we've already talked about the use of Kesh in this iconic motif, but I want to take a closer look at some of the things that are going on here. See, not only is Page creating this cool descending chromatic line against the static A minor chord, he is also creating an ascent ending melodic line. This creates three contrasting parts in this one motif, which can be described as counterpoint. Now, my classical knowledge is shoddy to say the least, but from what I can grasp, counterpoint describes the relationship between two or more lines or voices that are harmonically codependent 
yet rhythmically and melodically independent. In short, multiple lines moving independently but creating a coherent harmony. In this case, the descending chromatic line and ascending melody line are said to be moving in contrary motion, while the static A minor creates oblique motion with the other two lines. It's pretty awesome. The other thing I find interesting about this part is its movement between Dorian and Aeolian. This occurs a lot during Stairway and creates stark contrasts of light and shade within the music. Let's look at the second part for a clearer example. Here the tonality shifts from the darker A minor tonality of the first part to a brighter C major tonality. The thing that really stands out to me about this progression is the way that it shifts between darker and lighter tonalities, not just when moving from part one to part two, but also from chord to chord. This is achieved by switching between Dorian and Aeolian modes. Generally, keys and modes with more sharps have a brighter, more vibrant feeling to them, while the more flats, the darker they feel. It's not a happy versus sad feeling, but more like the sensation of lying on a hillside basking in the sunlight versus drifting on a lake by the light of the moon. As you can probably tell, it's a little bit difficult to describe, but for example, one of my favorite keys is D flat. It has this lovely, warm, rounded feeling to it, but take it up a semitone to D and that feeling changes to something much brighter and acute, at least in my opinion. A Aeolian is the sixth mode of C major, therefore is a scale without any sharps or flats, while A Dorian is the second mode of G major and contains one sharp, F sharp. This makes A Dorian a touch brighter than A Aeolian. This subtle change adds a whole lot to the overall feeling of this chord progression. Take the first four chords, C, D, F major 7, A minor. Having come out of the first part into this, we're already in a brighter place due to the change from A minor to C major, but then we're hit with this D major, a chord from A Dorian, and it's like... Then comes the change to A Aeolian with the F major 7 chord, and the change in tonality is instantly noticeable. Again, it's not sad or evil, but a slight change in perspective. Over the next two bars, we're in Sun City, all major chords, all in A Dorian. And then we get a repeat of the first two bars and all the feelings that go along with that. And finally, the last two bars end on that F major 7. This subtle change in tonality, not just on a macro scale from part to part, but through the chord progression creates a real sense of motion and contrast like walking through a forest where the canopy of leaves creates different areas of light and shade. And it would be remiss of me not to mention the gorgeous recorder melody that John Paul Jones plays over this section, itself exhibiting aspects of counterpoint. The melody rises and falls across the harmonic bass laid by the guitar, its counterpart moving in parallel thirds and sixths, while the lower voice outlines the root movement of the progression. There is one more thing I'd like to mention about this section before we move on to section B, and that's Robert Plant's melody line. The melody is a four bar phrase that, while the rhythmic phrasing changes slightly each time to fit the words, the contour of the line remains constant. What I mean by that is if you drew a line to represent the rising and falling of the melody each time it is sung, it's the same. And that makes sense since the chord progression repeats along with it until we get to here. The chord progression changes to that of part two, but Plant continues to sing the same melody over top. This results in the melody taking on a whole new feel as it melds with the new harmonic bass and the change in tonality. Next, we come to the first transitional section, the purpose of which is to bump up the intensity and propel the song forward into section B. And it does this by altering part one of section A in a couple of important ways. The first is to increase the rhythmic complexity of the motif by playing the arpeggios with 16th notes rather than 8th notes. This drives the section forward and prepares us for the more lively rhythms of the next section. The second is a small thing, but it's so perfect and adds so much. Page plays this big G major chord on beat 4 of the bar leading into the next section. Rather than explain exactly why this is important, just listen to what it sounds like without it. See what I mean? It's it's like a butler standing at the door welcoming your ears into section B. And since it was such a lovely warm welcome, let's head there now. 
As in section A, section B contains two alternating and contrasting parts. These parts contrast not just with each other, but with the parts from the previous section. Take part two of section B. Two guitars. Two guitars playing arpeggiated chords using a steady stream of eighth notes. This is a callback to section A where the same thing was happening. The only exception comes at the end of the phrase. Take a look at how the phrases end and how they differ from each other. In the phrases from section A, the final rhythm is this. While in section B, the rhythm is this. These differing rhythms instill wildly different feelings in the phrases. In the first, everything starts and ends on the downbeat. This, along with the constant flow of eighth notes, creates a nice, chill, floaty feel to the section that eases us into the song. But since things have started to build up post-transition number one, section B introduces a new form of rhythmic tension called syncopation. Syncopation is the act of placing emphasis on weaker beats in a bar. For example, if we take a bar of 4-4 four four and we play notes on on the beat, everything sounds nice and uniform. But now if we shift off the beat or add some syncopation, things get a little more edgy. There's some movement, some rhythmic tension, some forward momentum. That in mind, take a look at this part again and you'll see the syncopation at the end of the phrase making it a bit more lively than its counterpart in section A. The syncopation is taken to the next level in the first part of the section. The guitar part is strummed instead of arpeggiated and Page emphasizes a lot of offbeats all through this four bar phrase, especially in the last bar. Interestingly, the bass takes a different tact. John Paul Jones supports the syncopation in the first two bars by mirroring the rhythms of the guitar, but here he plays solid on the beat, creating a tension between the guitar and bass parts. There is also some interesting stuff happening harmonically. The chord progression here is A minor D, A minor D, essentially a 2-5 cadence in G major that never resolves. This creates enough suspense on its own, but Page does a few things with the chords to add that little bit of extra intrigue. He creates a melody on top of the chords, much like he did in the intro motif. And this melody isn't simply chord tones, rather Page uses color tones to create and release tension through the chord progression. It starts with a G being the seventh of the A minor chord. That G then becomes the suspended fourth of the D chord, which he then resolves to F sharp, the third. This is pretty standard, but what he does in the next two bars really stands out. The A minor is the same, but instead of just doing the D sus thing again, Page plays a sequence of triads over the D bass note, starting with G major, followed by D, then C, and then finally D again. Not only is this a cool melody, but the G and C chords played over a D bass note behave similar to the D sus from previously, creating tension and leading our ear back to the D major chord. All of this harmonic and rhythmic interest makes the music far more energetic and suspense filled than anything we've heard up until this point. It also creates the perfect backdrop to Plant's vocals as he sings. This very stark contrast between these parts not only mirrors the contrast we saw in section A, but has a very practical application as well. The vocal part here needs to stand out so the message and the lyrics can be clearly understood, so the accompaniment is less complex and intrusive. But when we go back to part one of this section, the vocal part is less important, so things can get a bit more complex. Now I just briefly want to touch on what happens once the drums enter and how awesome it is. John Bonham slides right into the mix with an unassuming drum fill right here. As you would expect, this adds another layer of oomph to the song, continuing our tradition of a slow and steady increase towards the climaxes. Now take a look at these two drum parts and try and guess which one is accompanying which part of the section. That's right, Bonham keeps things super simple when accompanying part two, only breaking from a steady 4-4 rock beat to play drum fills that lead into the syncopated figure at the end of the phrase. For part one, however, Bonham kicks things up a notch, switching to the right cymbal while supporting the syncopated figures of the guitar with his own figure on the bass drum. Not only that, but he locks in tight with the new and improved bass line from John Paul Jones, which is, in a word, badass, and one of my favorite parts of the song. Just check this out. Over 
Over the course of this section, Jones's bassline has evolved from simply providing the bass notes to this fantastic grooven line with interesting syncopated rhythms and funky Motown-esque fills. I love it. Every aspect of this section of the song, the composition, harmony, melody, instrumentation, rhythm, all the stuff I've just talked about, works to create and support the contrast between the two alternating parts. Not only does this provide commonality with the first section of the song by mirroring its use of contrast, but it keeps the listener continually engaged. Right, on to the final section of the song and those climaxes I keep talking about. Now would also be a good time to briefly mention the tempo of the song. As I've mentioned already, the song starts out super chill and the tempo reflects that, being around 74 BPM. But the tempo steadily increases across the runtime of the song, and this isn't a bad thing. Just like how increasing things like dynamics or harmonic or rhythmic complexity can ramp up the energy of the song, so too can an increase in tempo. The most stark example of this is in the second transitional section. The song is increased in tempo to about 90 BPM at the beginning of this section, but shoots up a whole 10 BPM to 100 BPM by the end as it crashes into the guitar solo. Now, I'm not going to go through every note of the guitar solo because I've kind of already done that in another video and would probably add another hour to this already way too long video. But there are a few things I do want to talk about in this section. Number one, John Paul Jones's bass line. There is so much amazing stuff happening in Jones's bass line under this relatively short 45 second guitar solo that I could probably make a whole video on it. But I'm going to shoot through it all real quick because we've discussed each of the things in more depth earlier in the video. Number one, establishing a solid rhythmic figure that underpins the section. While a solid eighth note line would provide a harmonic bass, it would lack the character that is afforded by this cool little figure. The basic figure looks like this. It's mirrored by Bonham on the drums and really accentuated in the second part of this section. Number two, groove through syncopation. Jones could have just stuck strictly to the aforementioned rhythmic figure, but instead he elaborates on it by adding in 16th note syncopation. Throughout these bars, he leads into each chord change with an offbeat 16th note, and he ends each two bar phrase with this offbeat 16th note figure. As the solo increases in intensity, he adds in more of the syncopation to different parts of the bar. All of this kicks the groove level up to James Jameson levels of groovitude. Number three, this four bar phrase. Just listen to how goddamn awesome this is. Laying down that rhythmic figure while grooving like a motherfucker using those syncopation ideas and some truly epic 16th note fills. 10 out of 10, best part of the song. Number two of the previous list I was making that wasn't the sub list of John Paul Jones's awesomeness. Part two. <laughs> so like I said earlier, this song has two climaxes, a narrative one and a musical one, and it reaches the first at the end of this guitar solo. I remember as a kid being mesmerized by this one bar because it was so damn epic. I would sit on my bed with my guitar and my copy of the Stairway to Heaven sheet music which I had purchased from my local music store, there was no ultimate guitar in those days, and try and try and try and try and try and try to play this awesome little lick. There was just something about it. I'd been taken on this epic journey from a smoky tavern where the eerie sounds of an acoustic guitar drift out across a Scottish moor, led by the piper through a magical forest over the misty mountains to the far reaches of Middle Earth. It really feels like you've climbed the stairway all the way to the top to have your senses assaulted by the glorious sights and sounds of an unknown realm. Or, you know, epic shred fast guitar hide notes. <clears throat> There are two other songs that as a young guitarist I was enamoured by, Hotel California and Sultans of Swing, and looking back I think my admiration came from a combination of these two things. Both tell their own unique interesting story that draws you into another place, taking you on a journey, whether that's to a creepy hotel that traps travellers so that they can be sacrificed to some demonic beast, or to a bougie jazz club in London, and supporting that story with a well crafted musical bass that utilises various musical techniques to keep you engaged as it builds to a climax. Add a healthy dose of excellent musicianship and you've got yourself a hit, baby. Number three, 
John Bonham does everything perfectly. If you want an in-depth look at how awesome John Bonham's drumming really is, check out this fantastic video from Polyphonic. For now, let's just say his drumming is solid as a rock. He knows when to keep things simple and allow the guitar solo to shine, and when to bust out godlike drum fills to make the epicometer explode. Just look at what's going on in the climactic bar of the solo. Finally, the song comes crashing into its finale, an explosive, driving, hard rock section where the band is in full swing. Jones and Bonham lay down the rhythmic foundation that was foreshadowed under the guitar solo. This is mirrored by the rhythm guitar playing big staccato chords, starting on A minor, moving down to G, and then finally to F. Page soon adds in this cool guitar line that outlines an F major 7 arpeggio, which I never noticed in the original recording, but was always very prominent in live recordings since Page would play it instead of the chords and plants soaring vocal line tops the whole thing off aggressive biting and stratospherically high the voice slaps you in the face with all the ferocity we expect from the climax of a hard rock song plant bellows out his final note that wafts and warps above the band as they wind their way down to the final chord of the song and plant sings that same refrain from right back at the beginning of the song the only difference now that he is singing it over a bright, dense, lingering F major 7 chord, a subtle contrast to its pairing with A minor in the beginning. Stairway to Heaven is a song of contrasts, from its counterpoint guitar lines, to its subtle changes in tonality, to its gradual move from soft ballad to hard rock anthem. So it's only fitting that the song would begin and end with similar but contrasting motifs. There is no doubt that Stairway to Heaven is a masterpiece, but also somewhat of an anomaly within the Led Zeppelin canon. Up until the release of Led Zeppelin 4, Zeppelin songs were primarily hard rock or blues songs that all followed pretty standard rock formats. Verse, chorus, solo, verse, chorus, heavy riffs, 12 bar blues, all that good stuff. And there's nothing wrong with that. But like all good artists, Led Zeppelin wasn't content with just releasing the same stuff over and over. And Led Zeppelin 4 was their first big step in a new direction for their sound. It was their rubber soul, their Dark Side of the Moon, their Kid A. As I've discussed, Stairway bucks the standard song format for that of a through composed form. It moves through various different styles, tonalities, and instrumentations over its eight minute runtime to more closely resemble a progressive rock song, but several years before Wish You Were Here or Selling England by the Pound. And it paved the way for more long form through composed songs such as No Quarter, Cashmere, and my personal favorite, Achilles Last Stand. Stairway to Heaven stands as a triumph of great songwriting, the product of four master musicians coming together at the height of their careers and creating something timeless and magical, a piece of art that has captured the imaginations of millions across lines of age, race and culture, and nearly 50 years later continues to inspire new generations of musicians with its incredible composition, fantastical lyrics and masterful musicianship while endlessly annoying workers at guitar stores the world over. And though Zeppelin would go on to create create dozens of more epic memorable tracks, there is no denying the shadow created by the lady buying a stairway to heaven. It's done. I'm finished. It only took me about 6,000 years. Uh, but thank you for being so patient while I worked on this one. Obviously there's been a lot going on in the world, uh, so that definitely affected my production. Uh, I also went back to university recently and I'm doing my masters at the moment, so it's kind of a miracle that I actually got this finished. <laughs> uh, but I hope that you enjoyed it and uh, it was a lot of fun to make. If you have another song that you'd like me to take a look at, then drop a comment below. Make sure that you like and subscribe and if you like what I do, then maybe consider becoming a patron over at patreon.com or making a one-off donation over at Ko-fi. Thanks again, stay safe, much love, Aslan. Oh yeah, that's, uh, that's my name now. Uh, I just haven't got around to changing it on the YouTube channel. Bye!